begin tonight um, just telling you a story. It's about a 16-year-old girl. Her name was Megan Meyer. It's actually a true story. But also about a young man by the name of Josh Evans. Well, Josh Evans was a very nice-looking 16-year-old, apparently. And Tina Meyer was on the computer. That was back in the days of MySpace. Uh, some of y'all may know MySpace. Now it's Facebook, or at least in this area. I think in some other parts of our nation, uh, MySpace is still used. But, you know, it's one of those social networking things off the Internet uh, where people, you know, get on and they find old friends and you can communicate and all that kind of thing. But um, Megan was actually on MySpace, and this boy, Josh Evans, his picture came up. And he started communicating with Megan. And Megan cried out to her mom, 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 look at him. And her mom, of course, remembered her calling her in that day and saying that. And um, basically, Megan had asked her mom, Tina, that's her mom's name, if she could ask, add Josh as her friend on MySpace. And she said, Mom, he's cute, <laughs> you know. And, uh, but anyway, um, Tina asked her daughter, said, do you know who he is? Have you ever met him? And <coughs> Megan said, no, but look at him. And these were her words. He's hot. You know? Just like a 16-year-old girl, I guess, would say. <laughs> but anyway, when she asked her mom, she could add him as her friend. Her mom said yes. And so for <laughs> six weeks, Megan and Josh... Under her mom's very watchful eye, and you do need to be careful about that, they became, you know, very acquainted and started communicating through that virtual world of MySpace. Well, Josh said he was born in Florida, and he had recently moved to their town. He was homeschooled. He played the guitar, and he played the drums. But also, he had told Megan he was from a broken home, that when he was seven years old, their dad left him and his mom, and his older brother, and apparently at the time, had a newborn brother. So there were three boys, and, and he said he knew that his poor mom had had such a hard time when they were younger and trying to find work to pay, you know, for all of them. Well, as for Megan, she sort of described herself using an acrostic with her name, M-E-G-A-N. -E M was for modern. E was for enthusiastic. G was for goofy. A was for alluring, and N was for neglected. You see, Megan, she loved swimming, and she loved boating, and fishing, and she liked dolls. She liked rap music. I know that's a lot of y'all's favorite out there, rap music. And, and she liked boys. <laughs> but her life had not always been an easy life. Um, she was heavy, and for years had tried to lose weight. She also had been diagnosed with Attention Deficit Disorder, or ADD, ADD, and also had battled depression in, in her young life. And actually back in the third grade, she had actually talked about at one point about suicide. And her mom says that ever since then, that had gotten their daughter in, you know, with a therapist, and she had met with this therapist on a regular basis. But at this point in her life, for Megan, things were going really well. She had lost about 20 pounds. Um, she was five feet, five and a half inches tall. Um, she had just started eighth grade at a new school. I said she was 16, she was actually 13 at a new school. And she was on the volleyball team there. And she had attended some public schools before that. But amid all of this, her mom, Megan's mom, Tina said, that her daughter at one point had decided to end a friendship with a girl, a friend of hers that lived down the street from them. And it said the girls had spent a lot of the seventh grade together, alternating between being friends. You know, it was one of those relationships at that age. One minute you're friends, one minute you're not friends, and that kind of thing. But part of the reason for Megan's rosy outlook was this young boy named Josh. And uh, after school, Megan would rush to her computer and she'd get on to MySpace. And, uh, you know, because of Megan's weight problem, because of, you know, her low self-esteem, you know, she just 
had a struggle. And this boy now, who was paying her attention, you know, that was really building her esteem. Really building up her confidence. But her mom said it seemed really odd that Josh, this young boy, had never asked for Megan's phone number. And when Megan had asked for his phone number, his reply was that he didn't have a cell, number, cell phone. And his mother didn't actually have a landline phone in the house. Well, on Sunday, and this was October the 15th, 2006, Megan received a very puzzling and disturbing message on MySpace from Josh. And her mom recalled that it said, I don't know if I want to be friends with you anymore because I've heard that you are not very nice to your friends. Well, Megan just kind of became frantic and just couldn't imagine where out of the blue where this came from. And so she replied back to Josh said, what are you talking about? Well, that very next day on Monday, October the 16th, 2006, it was a rainy kind of day. And Megan was at school and she was handing out invitations for an upcoming birthday party that she was having. And so when she got home, she asked her mom if she could log on to MySpace to see if Josh had actually responded to that invitation. And, you know, just going over in her mind, she really trying to figure out why did all of a sudden he think that she was me? You know, who had he been talking to? Well, her mom, she allowed her to get on the computer. But her mom at this point was in a hurry because her mom had to take Megan's younger sister um, to the orthodontist. But before Megan's mom, Tina, could actually get out the door, she could see that Megan was really upset. See, Josh had started and continued to send very troubling, in many ways, these hateful messages to Megan. And apparently, he had also shared some of these messages with others, with Megan's friend. Well, when her mom, right before she got ready to leave, she told Megan, you need to sign off for the computer. And Megan said, I will, Mom, let me finish up. Well, Tina was in a hurry again trying to get her younger daughter to the orthodontist. And so she left. And when she got to the orthodontist office, she called back to the house and called Megan and said, Did you sign off? And Megan said, No, Mom. They're all being so mean to me. And her mom said, Megan, you're not listening to me. Sign off now. Well, 15 minutes later, Megan called her mother back. And by this time, Megan was just absolutely in tears. And she said, Mom, they're posting bulletins about me. And what bulletins were was kind of like a survey where you would put out surveys and you're supposed to, they do this on Facebook now, where you give your opinion of people, you know, based on the survey. And of course, they were saying just absolutely hateful, just hateful words about Megan in these surveys. And so Megan was just sobbing hysterically. And her mom was just absolutely furious that her daughter had not signed off like she had told her to. Well, once her mom got home, she rushed down into the basement where their computer was. And she saw these messages that were posted and just the vulgar language that her actual daughter, Megan, was firing back at the people. And her mom, Tina, just jumped all over Megan and said, I am so aggravated at you for doing this. And Megan just got up and she ran from the computer and she left. But not without first telling her mom, you're supposed to be my mom. You're supposed to be on my side. Well, as she ran out of the basement and on the stairway leading to her bedroom, which was on the second floor, Megan ran into her father. His name was Ron. And Ron said he grabbed her and he, he, as she tried to go by. And he said that his daughter had told him that some kids were saying horrible stuff about her and that she didn't understand why. And, and her dad tried to console her and say, you know, it's okay. And he said he told her that they obviously didn't know her and they would all be fine. Well, Megan went to her room. Her father went on downstairs to the kitchen where his wife, Tina, were working on getting supper together. And they got to talking about all that had happened and about the MySpace account and that kind of thing. Well, 20 minutes later, while they're talking and preparing food, Tina, Megan's mother, just kind of suddenly froze in just mid-sentence. And she just dropped what she's doing. She said, I had this god-awful feeling, and I ran up into her room, and there she found her daughter had hung. 
hung herself in her closet. And of course, they called the ambulance and rushed Megan to the hospital where she actually died the next day, three weeks before her 14th birthday. Well, later on that day, the rest of the story, Ron had gone to the computer, opened his daughter's MySpace account, and saw what he believed was the last message that Megan actually saw. And it was from Josh. And the, me the message said something like, Everybody in O'Fallon, the town where they lived, knows how you are. You are a bad person and everybody hates you. And he said, Have a, and used an expletive, rest of your life. The world would be a better place without you. Well, six weeks after Megan had died, on a Saturday morning, a neighbor down the street from them, this was a different neighbor, one they didn't really know very well, called and asked Megan's parents, Ron and Tina, if they would meet with her that morning at a counselor's office. That she had something very important that she had to tell them. But she wouldn't give them details over the phone, so Ron and Tina decided to go, and their actual grief counselor was also there, as well as a counselor from the middle school that Megan attended. The neighbor from down the street who was a single mom, and she had a daughter the same age as Megan, she informed Ron and Tina that this Josh Evans never existed. Basically, what had happened, she told the Myers, is that Josh Evans was created by adults. It was a family on their block. And she said these adults were the parents of Megan's former girlfriend, the one that was mentioned earlier, uh, the one that, whom she had had a falling out with. And she said that her daughter, the single mom, her daughter, had carpooled with that family that was involved in creating this phony MySpace account with this Josh Evans' name. And her daughter had been given the password to this account and had sent one of the messages, the hateful messages, to Megan. Well, her daughter, she said, the single mom said, had been encouraged by this family to participate in this so-called joke. Well, the single mom said her daughter felt just horribly guilty for not saying something sooner and for writing that message. And said that her daughter didn't speak out sooner because she had known this other family for years and thought that they were what they were doing must be fine, must be okay. After all, they were trusted adults. Well, on that night when the ambulance came after Megan had hung herself, the single mom said before it left the Myers house, her daughter had actually received a call from this other family. And it was the woman behind the creation of this Josh Evans account. And she had called her daughter to tell her that something had happened to Megan and advised the girl not to mention the MySpace account. All of this tragedy, the loss of life of this 13, almost 14 year old girl, this mom and this dad, the Myers, whose life just in an instant completely just turned upside down because of their daughter's suicide, all because of words. And you know, we don't think about what kind of impact or what kind of effect our words might have on people. Now, we may not intentionally say anything mean or hateful or spiteful, but still you just don't ever know what words that might come out of your mouth might have an impact, whether it's good or especially whether it's bad, on another person. Turn to the first chapter of the book of James. And I want to look at just three things tonight in relation to words. First of all, words and righteousness. Words and worship. And then words and the temple of God. So first thing, words and worship. Beginning in chapter 1 of James, beginning in verse 19. 
We read, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Just stop right there for a moment. How do words relate to our righteousness? How do they connect there? Well, at the beginning of this passage in verse 19, we, three, we see three specific instructions. Be quick to listen. And I know I can be one who speaks more often than I listen. But isn't it amazing how much you actually learn? If you'll just shut your lips for a few moments and just listen to what people are saying. I don't know what Laura, Laura was trying to tell me something the other day. And, and I actually was repeating back what I thought she was telling me. And she said, no, you're not listening to me. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, what she was saying and what I was interpreting what she was saying was two different things. And it was all because I wasn't intently listening and concentrating on what she was saying. So the first instruction, be quick to listen. The second instruction, be slow to speak. Just goes right along with that. Have you ever been in a situation where you just think automatically you know what a person's about to tell you and so you just go right ahead and help them go ahead and say it? <laughs> Michelle just gave Marla a dirty look. <laughs> I mean, I mean, especially married couples, you do that all the time. Because after you're married for a while, you think you just automatically know what the spouse is going to say. Okay? But be quick to listen, be slow to speak, and be slow to become angry. Again, how many times have you heard somebody make a statement or somebody say something, whether it was you personally, directly, or whether it was somebody indirectly, and your first response is going to be to what? Get angry. Get mad at it. Okay? But maybe whoever mentioned it to you, if it was indirectly, maybe it wasn't exactly interpreted correctly. Or instead of getting angry off the bat, maybe you need to go to that person and say, this is what I've been told. Is this correct? Or somebody just misinterpreting it all. Have I got the wrong information? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. You see, in verse 20, anger is certainly not, as I taught the other week, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? And remember the other, remember the other week when we talked about that, we were talking about fruits. I mentioned in, in God's Word, the passage you looked at, it's singular, it's fruit. They all are a package deal. It's not, okay, I just want this fruit, but I don't want to have to worry about this fruit. Okay? It's all a package deal. And as the Holy Spirit comes and lives and dwells within us, we bear that fruit. That fruit. And one of the fruit, well, I don't know if it's fruit of the Spirit, but as a growing Christian in Christ, your life should show an evidence of that righteousness. Righteousness because, as it says in verse 21, of that word planted in you, that word of God. And of course, we did get into the passage tonight about sowing the seed and some seed being on the, the road that doesn't take root, some seed being on the rocky ground. Some, you know, we could get into all that tonight, but I won't. But the word of Jesus Christ planted in you. And, and then James says right here if you hear the word, but you don't do what it says, it's just like a person who looks in a mirror, and as soon as they walk away from the mirror, they forget what they look like. See, that's a person who might just hear the word, but it's not planted. If it was planted, 
It would change your life and transform your life. And you would be living the Word. Doing the Word. Instead of just hearing the Word. Jesus even said in John 8, 47. He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is because you do not belong to God. That's exactly what Jesus said. If we are just hearers of the word, and it's nothing more, if God's word is nothing more than just a bunch of black letters on white pages, and that's as far as it goes, and we just hear it, Jesus said right here, you do not belong to God. But if you hear the word, and you are doing the word, the word is lived out in your life, Jesus says, you belong to God. That's words and righteousness. Now what about words and worship? Look at verse 26 of that first chapter of James. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and thoughtless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the word. That word religion, here in the, the book of James, the Greek word for it is threskos. It actually means ceremonious in worship or pious. And in the passage here, it's literally translated ritualist, which is a, a practice or some type of demonstrative action, okay? But in verse 26 that we just read here, it says, If someone considers himself religious, but does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, the literal translation of that is, they have no bit-leading tongue. And of course, James later on in chapter 3, he talks about when you put bits into the mouths of the horses, that makes them obey you. You know, that bit that's hooked up to the reins. And you can actually turn the whole animal because of that bit. Okay, That's what this is referring to when it says when you don't have a tight brain on your tongue. You talk about no bit leading tongue. In other words, you're just running off at the mouth. I don't know of any other way to put it. <laughs> That's what James is talking about here. And then he says in verse 27, God considers pure and faultless religion... Or the pure, thoughtless practice of worship. One, he says, to attend to the needs of others. And he talks about orphans and widows here specifically. So especially those who may not be able to take care of their own needs themselves. And then the second thing he says that God considers pure and thoughtless worship or religion is to be unpolluted by the world. So the question I think we should ask ourselves is what or who has the greatest influence on your life? What or who has the greatest influence on your life? Is that greatest influence on your life, is it of the world <coughs> or is it of God? So what about words and the temple of God? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So therefore, honor God with your body. So let me ask you this. If our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit as believers in Jesus Christ and we've come and we've professed Christ is our Lord and Savior and surrendered our heart and life to Him and the Holy Spirit comes and lives and dwells within us and our body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit, does that part of the body exclude the tongue? No. Absolutely not. Over in James chapter 3 and I mentioned this just a second ago. Look up, turn over there with me real quick. James chapter 3, look at verse 5. Look what James writes here. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. 
The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. James talks about here the tongue. That's just a small little part of our whole body. But this small little part can produce and result in extraordinary consequences and cause extraordinary damage, just as in this story that I started out with tonight. See, we cannot offer that pure and faultless worship that God accepts and then turn around and utter false and slanderous and destructive words. Look at verse 9 of James chapter 3. It says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. And then in verse 11, Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. James kind of being sarcastic there. But basically what he is saying, if you think that at one moment you can utter praise to Jesus Christ, sing his praises, pray to him, thank him, and then in the next moment utter words of destruction and cursing and damaging. He's saying, just as a salt spring is not going to produce fresh water, it won't happen. It doesn't happen. You cannot utter words of praise to God one minute and then curse your fellow human being the next. Those words of praise that might come out of your mouth, they mean absolutely nothing to God. I've heard pastors say if they're preaching maybe a message like this that kind of might touch a nerve or step on a few toes. I heard a pastor one time say, don't get mad at me. It's not my words. It's God's words. <laughs> you know? And that's what it is. And sometimes hearing God's words, especially if they convict our hearts, it can make us angry. Or they can humble us. Last passage here. Close real quick. I'll finish up with this. Proverbs chapter 6. Turn over there real quick. Proverbs chapter 6. Beginning in verse 16. says here, there are six things the Lord hates. It's a pretty strong word. But I think that's the exact word that's meant to be used here. Then it says, no, seven that are detestable to Him. Again, strong words. And they're not here by accident. What are those seven things? Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. How many of these things that it says the Lord hates, that the Lord finds detestable, how many of these things are related to words from our mouths? Are related to the tongue? And it's interesting to see that even in here when they're talking about words like a lying tongue, a false witness who pours out lies, when they're talking about that, grouped up within that is also hands that shed innocent blood, which is what? Murder. It says right here in Proverbs that our words, hateful, despiteful, destructing words, are right there on the same plane, the same level, as murder. That's what it's saying right here in God's Word. 
You see, it may be a small part of the body, but it can cause great harm. And you might say tonight, well, where's the harm? Well, one, harming the person who the words are spoken against, or harming the body of believers, the church that that person may be associated with, or that is also possibly spoken against. Or the third thing, harming the person that is actually uttering those damaging words. And in many cases, it ends up where it becomes more damaging to the source of the words than it does to the object of the destructive words. So what's the answer? Proverbs 15.4 says, The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Those are words that bring comfort, not turmoil. Proverbs 16.24 says, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. Those are words that, are, that encourage, not discourage. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Words that build up, not tear down. So what do your words reveal about you? Do they reveal righteousness? Do they reveal the Word of God that is planted in you? Do they reveal you as a doer of the Word instead of just a hearer? Do your words reveal a true heart of worship, that pure and faultless worship that pleases God, that God, that God accepts? Or do your words just reveal just a, a ritualistic practice of religion? Or are the words that proceed from your mouth, are they words that are consistent from one whose body is the temple of God and whom the presence of the Holy Spirit dwells with.